Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us for this webcast, Building a Remote First Learning Ecosystem, sponsored by InfoPro Learning. This webcast has been pre-approved for HRCI and can be submitted for SHRM credit. Please be sure to attend the complete webcast in order to receive your credits. If you have any questions during the webcast, click on the Q&A tab in your webinar controls and type them there. A new tab will open in your browser with the webcast survey. Please be sure to complete it as soon as the webcast is ended. It is now my pleasure to turn it over to Sherry Weppel for the presentation. Thank you so much. It is such a pleasure to be here. Uh, looking forward to talking about building a remote learning ecosystem. Uh, just to give you a little bit of a background first about our organization. So a little bit about InfoPro. Uh, we, our mission is really to unlock potential. So it's not to develop volumes of e-learning content. It's not to develop um, you know, large scopes of, of training solutions, but it's really to be able to build meaningful learning, learning experiences. We want to measure performable impact and we want to get sustainable operational excellence. We're going to touch on a lot of those points as we go through the session here. On this slide, it's going to give you a little bit about us by the numbers, who some of our clients are, some of the great awards that we've won, um, just some stats about what we what we've been able to achieve as an organization. Um, giving you a little bit of a background about me, and then I have a really great story to kind of start, start our session. So I am a what I call a recovering art major and a client success leader. So I started my career as an art teacher. Um, I was doing drawing and painting. I was doing technology in the classroom. And eventually after seven years of middle school children, I decided that it was time for something a little bit new. So I moved into instructional design started doing a lot of learning strategy, instructional design and development, and eventually moved into account management. Um, and then eventually found myself the vice president of client success. So I really focus on unlocking the potential of my leadership team um, who work for me to support our individual customers, making sure that our clients are successful and focusing on process improvement. A little bit about me personally is I love to run 5K races. Uh, my husband always jokes that it's 5K, it's not five miles. Um, he doesn't want to run anything more than three. Uh, I, my favorite coworker is Abby, who's actually sitting across the room from me right now. And that's been one of the blessings of this virtual world that we're now in. And up until recently, I really enjoyed travel um, and working with a dog rescue. So as I started to think about this topic, and as I started to think about um, presenting this, this training today, it was a very interesting and very poignant time for me. So I actually just did my first international travel since the beginning of the pandemic. So last week I was in Switzerland uh, for a couple of days and then I was in London for a couple of days. And, you know, it's a very interesting time to be traveling again. You know, I used to travel every other week. We got very used to and very efficient at being remote. Um, but I remember sitting with my customer and both of us remarked on how we couldn't really achieve what we had achieved last week without physically being present with one another, breaking bread, um, you know, getting to meet with individuals in a room and being able to talk. Now, one of the challenges about traveling internationally with the U.S. at this point is the fact that you do need a beautiful no, negative COVID test to be able to return to the country. So I found myself in London testing myself uh, at a lab to make sure that I was able to return home. And luckily I was able to return home and got on that airplane and headed home. And by the time I was home, I had COVID. Um, so I apologize if I'm a little breathless today. <laughs> I'm actually still in the midst of recovering from it. But for me, it really shows the importance of how can we make virtual an optimal solution? Because maybe it's not safe always to travel. Uh, maybe it's not convenient always to travel. I actually, when I was having my session last week, had two individuals who were remote um, with a room full of people. And so we're going to talk about some of those experiences as we talk about remote first today. So there are a lot of reasons why somebody might be more comfortable being at home. Um, you know, we've gotten into different childcare routines since the pandemic. Um, travel is now really expensive, um, much more expensive than it once was. And we may be inclined to just put that square peg in that round hole as we do virtual training. So we might say, okay, well, I had this PowerPoint deck. I used to deliver it in person. I'm now just going to have everybody sit in front of their computer and I'm going to deliver it virtually. And really what we find is that we need to reinvent what that training looks like in order to be super effective. Um, one of the great stories I will tell you is I, when I was getting one of my master's degrees, 
I took a asynchronous training course. Uh, one of my courses was asynchronous. And the way in which they did that asynchronous course was when they held it synchronously the, the semester before, they just simply reported it. So we were given, and this will age me, but we were given a bunch of CDs at the time to be able to play that had all of the different class recordings on it. And you were just listening to other people's dialogue. You were listening to other people ask questions. You were listening to that presenter and you were listening to the presenter at times even say, does anybody have any questions? And you kind of desperately want to raise your hand and say, you know, I have a question, but it's a recording and you can't. So it was really one of those situations where that wasn't the optimal way to be able to deliver that training. And we really should have given more thought as to what that training looked like. So we're going to talk a lot about that today. So we're going to start with a really quick poll. Um, so Hester, if you could pull, put that poll out there. I want to get your opinions first, and you can also chime into the chat window. Um, love to have these interactions be super interactive and engaging. But we're really looking at what's the single most important thing of a remote first learning ecosystem. Is it the connection? Is it the diversity of experiences? Is it the asynchronous experience and how engaging that that might be? Is it how personalized that instruction is for them? I think there isn't necessarily a right or a wrong answer in this particular case, but I'm very interested as to what you perceive to be the most important thing. We're going to talk about a lot of these elements as we go through the session today. And this first section that we're going to talk about is the differences between remote first versus very traditional training programs. So we're going to give you another couple of minutes, giving some think, um, giving some time to think this through as I, I love watching the little stats move. And so it looks like connection and asynchronous experience are neck and neck for, for top billing on this particular poll. Um, it really does depend on a lot of what your priorities are as an organization too. So if your selection isn't the one that's most, most selected out of the poll, totally okay. Um, so it looks like we have 38% choosing connection. So I actually do agree with you. Um, it looks like asynchronous came in second, diversity of experience or personalization came in third and diversity of experience came in fourth. So interesting poll, let's dive right in. So I'm going to start each of these sections with a story. And the reason why I start these, these sections with a story is because it's good to hear about that worst case scenario. Um, you know, we always like to talk about this was the virtual training session we did and everybody was engaged and they loved it and they got everything that they wanted out of it. But we don't like to talk about the training sessions that didn't go well. Probably the worst case scenario of a training session that I was actually in was when I was in the classroom as a participant. And it was a classroom with, let me think about it a little bit. There maybe was a little monitor on the wall. Um, so picture like maybe the size of the, the TV in your living room that there was a, a projection of the content. And Everybody was inside of the classroom and there was actually decent audio. You know, there was, we were able to communicate and we were able to have that audio recorded. There was no facilitator. Um, the entire thing was asynchronous from a instructor perspective. It was really a worst case scenario because it allowed all of us to exhibit some of the worst learner behaviors that you can possibly imagine. Um, you know, we were having little side conversations. Um, if we could, the instructor couldn't always hear what we had to say, um, you know, it just really wasn't something that was sticky. That poor instructor was looking at pictures of us on the screen that were like this big. Um, so they couldn't see body language. They couldn't see, they couldn't necessarily call on each one of us. Um, and it was just a really bad experience to be able to conduct training that way. So what we want to do is we want to think about what that experience looks like which sometimes will disagree with perhaps how much time we have allocated to be able to pull this training together, how much budget we have that we have accessible to us, um, you know, how much flexibility we have with technology and different things like that. So as we think about some of this, the secret elements of instructor-led training or what makes our instructor-led training so successful, it's hard to say, but forced engagement is one of the things that makes it so successful. Uh, you know, I could give a series of e-learning to an individual, and I don't know if on the other side of the screen, if they're actually just using the scrubber bar, clicking next, using the scrubber bar, clicking next. Because I got to be honest, as a training designer at heart, 
I am totally that person who is just clicking next and clicking next sometimes and hoping that I can pass that test. With instructor-led training, it's really hard to do that. You know, there is that guilt element of the person standing in the front of the room that you do feel like you should be paying attention to them. There is that eye contact as well, where, you know, all you have to do as an instructor is walk next to somebody, behind somebody, make eye contact with them to be able to get them to continue to engage. Hopefully, if you've set up your housekeeping rules at the beginning of the session properly, um, you do have reduced distractions. So hopefully computers are closed, phones are put away. Whereas if I'm sitting in my office and I'm taking a training myself, you know, I'm over here, I have my phone here and I might be looking at something over here. Um, you know, I might have another screen up that I'm looking at as well. Um, I can't guarantee that I'm 100% focused as I might be able to be in a classroom. When it comes to instructor-led training, you also have the ability to do really solid group work. So you can split people into groups, a um, little bit easier than doing breakout sessions. You can have a lot of really rich dialogue because everybody feels comfortable that there's confidentiality. When you're doing a virtual instruction, you can't guarantee that it's not being recorded. You can't really see who else is listening. Um, and so having, especially if you're talking about DNI sorts of conversations or any kind of leadership conversations where people might feel more vulnerable, they're going to feel less vulnerable in a classroom than they would feel in a virtual environment. The last component that I will bring in as a benefit of instructor-led training is the lack of technical issues. So short of a marker, maybe running out of ink or getting to the last piece of paper on the flip chart. There's or or a bulb in a projector breaking or something like that. There's very limited issues that you can't prevent when it comes to in-person training. You know, you can get there 15, 20 minutes ahead of time. You can make sure that everything is working well to ensure that you have success. When you're doing remote instruction, you don't have any control over the um, network connectivity. You don't have any control over when they last updated their operating system or their browser. There's so much that's left in the open that can be very frustrating to learners. Now, I don't want everybody to kind of close the laptop lid at this point and be like, okay, so I'm definitely not going remote. Um, it sounds like a disaster out there. That's not the case at all. What it, it does mean is that we need to plan ahead for these things and we need to be able to design something that's gonna be remote first where we take all of these elements into consideration. So some of the unspoken negatives, so let's give those negatives a fair, fair, fair time too about in-person training. Number one, huge time commitment. You know, if you're flying somebody to a training center or you're flying individuals in, you have the travel time that's allocated to it. Plus, because you've spent money on travel, you are probably going to want to make sure that you're getting your ROI on that. So you're doing not a 20 minute training, you're doing a two to three minute training. So there's definitely some time commitment associated with that. You also have people trapped in a room for, you know, seven, eight hours. Even if you do breakout sessions, even if you do worksheets, even if you get people standing up and doing jumping jacks, it's still a single modality for that entire time. And there's just, there's boredom. Um, you know, there's potentially lack of comprehension because we just get to the point where there's information overload. Uh, you also only have that single opportunity. So if for some reason your facilitator isn't right, the content isn't right, somebody isn't getting it, you don't necessarily have a lot of opportunities to recover. Um, you may not find out until you get those results at the end where you do your smile sheets that something was amiss or that something wasn't there. And at that point in time, you have no recovery to be able to do that. Whereas when you're doing virtual, you can really switch things up quite a bit. You know, you can make things very engaging. You can have virtual sessions. You can have online sessions. You can have games. You can have all sorts of stuff that they can do. And you can also kind of do a little bit of those checkpoints as they go through all of those elements so that you have an opportunity to recover. If you go through and you assign a, a introductory module and everybody gives you a big fat thumbs down, you can take a pause and readdress what else you're rolling out and make some changes there. So it gives you a lot more flexibility. So here's the difference. Um, traditional programs are typically going to have a very scheduled duration. So you're going to have a defined period of time in which it starts and ends. They're really designed to leverage those in-person interactions. So you're really leveraging the ability to be in person, to kind of force that interactivity, to force that engagement. Um, 
you're limited a little bit in your modalities. Again, you can do games, you can do breakout sessions and things like that, but you are limited to things that you can do in the classroom. It does lean in on those in-person interactions, um, which can, <clears throat> excuse me, which can actually be a very good thing. Um, you can actually get a lot of benefit out of being in person to build that connectivity because we did note that that was something that was really important to us. But it does give you a limited opportunity to recover. Um, the other piece of it is, is it's one and done. You conduct that training and yes, you can use that PowerPoint again, or yes, you can use that game again or that interaction again, but you're going to have to respend for that travel cost. You're going to have to rebook those facilities. You're going to have to pay for lunch again. Um, so there is a one and done sort of a mentality to it from a budget standpoint. When you talk about remote first, there's typically some sort of a learner journey. So there's a beginning and an end and a flow. It's not a one-stop shop where they go into one training, they sit there until they're done, and you're just kind of filling that cup until hopefully it's full, hopefully it didn't overfill. You can really design with those virtual elements in mind. Um, so you can think about the fact that people are virtual and you can take advantage of that and use some of those things to your, your best advantage. You can give a lot of diversity of modalities. You can have a lot of different experiences. You can do little videos. You can do little animations. We can do um, surveys. We can do pre-assessments, post-assessments, online training, games virtual instruction, there's just the limit, it's limitless as to what kind of experiences you could have for those learners. You can also have very purposeful engagement. So it's not that you can't have the same connection that you have um, in an in-person training, but you're gonna have to build it and you're gonna have to have that in mind as you're building it. There are also multiple entry points to a journey, um, which gives you a lot of opportunity to recover a missed connection. So if you look at your stats as people take training and you see that, um, you know, everybody got a low score on the assessment. You can quickly roll out a, a virtual instruction, group everybody together, answer questions before they continue to move forward. Whereas in an in-person instruction, you're really depending on people having the courage to raise their hand and ask. Um, also, there's lots of different points for connection, but we're going to talk about that in a little bit. So I did see that a lot of you included some questions that you had um, inside of the portal. And so they do give me advanced copies of that. So I did want to, I pulled some of them across as, as we were going through and tried to match and marry it to the different sections. So we want to, you know, we've talked about this a little bit. How do we ensure that virtual learning participants get the same quality as in person? Um, by being really purposeful about the interactions, by not just saying, okay, I'm going to lift and shift this to virtual really thinking about what those interactions are going to be and how we maintain that connectivity and how we maintain that interaction. So it's really having that purposeful learner, learner journey and looking at the different modalities we're going to do with that connectivity in mind to make sure that we get that same quality. What we don't want to do, and we'll talk about this in the third section, is we don't want to just front load a ton of e-learning modules that all look the same and all look identical we don't want to do that because that's not going to have a good experience. That would be the equivalent of having an instructor stand in front of the classroom and talk at you for eight hours, which we all know is not a good idea. How do we ensure that the training was effective? Um, we talked about this a little bit with the form of assessments. And so unlike in an instructor-led training where you're going to give that smile sheet at the end of the one day, two day, three day, five day, you can put assessments all over the place. Assessments can look like a survey. They can look like um, a VILT where you're asking questions, they can look like a game. There's lots of different ways in which you can ensure that that training is effective by just doing frequent and small assessments to check their knowledge as they go through and check their comprehension and, and how they're kind of doing in the program so that you're not getting too far into the program and not getting and, and not knowing that you're not going to get a return on your investment. So what is the optimal mix, optimal mix of instructor-led session versus self-service? It really does depend on the content. Um, it's going to depend on um, what type of content you're doing. So if you're doing leadership content, you're probably going to want more 60-40. There's going to be a lot of information where um, you're going to want to have dialogue, you're going to want to have coaching, you're going to want to have a lot of high degree of engagement. If you're talking about like application-based training, you're probably going to be more like 80-20, where 80% 80 is going to be online self-service because having somebody stand at the front of the classroom and click through a process is not really engaging anyway. So it's really thinking about 
what is it that the instructor would normally be doing at the front of the classroom? And if they're interacting and there's back and forth with the instruct with the students, you're going to want that to stay some form of instructor led or virtual. If when you think about the instructor teaching, the instructor is just kind of talking and going over core content, that's something that you could easily transition to online. How can we create virtual activities that actually use being virtual to an advantage instead of just shoving folks into a breakout room? I loved this question because we don't want to shove people into a breakout room. So again, it's those virtual activities don't have to be in person um, at the same time. They don't have to be synchronous. We can have virtual activities where everybody is doing something to, by themselves, like whether they're creating, uh, completing a game, whether they're completing some sort of online activity, and then maybe we pull them together for that interaction. So I think the biggest point is really focusing on what is it that you're trying to get out of that breakout session and make sure that that's the right mode for it. Um, you know, don't just put people into a room so that they can kind of talk and have that interaction. Make sure that there's purpose behind what you're trying to do. Um, next, we wanted to, somebody had asked, how do we make useful changes to onboarding measures to match the current climate of remote seeking employees? We really want to focus on um, that connection. And that's why I asked that question during the poll. Connection is the single most important part of what we're doing right now, um, especially with a completely remote workforce in a lot of situations. We need to not only build connection on day one, but we need to build that frequent connection and those spaces for connectivity, whether it be synchronous connectivity, whether it be Teams channels where people can talk. Um, we need to make sure that we're building that into our onboarding process, introducing them to their peers, introducing them to people that they can talk to in the same way that we would normally walk them around a room to be able to, to build those connections. And then last, how to onboard somebody and integrate them with their team and company remotely. It really is about that connectiveness. Um, I cannot stress that enough. We don't want to release to an employee on their first day, here's 60 hours of e-learning that you're going to complete in your first week. And then somebody's going to call you next week and you're going to get started in your job right away. Um, just this week, I'm actually onboarding somebody. She and I talk twice a day. We talk at the beginning of her day. Um, and then we talk at the end of her day. And we periodically will talk throughout the time, but really just to check in, make sure everybody's doing well um, and make sure that that everything is sticky, that she's getting what she needs. She feels welcome and she feels a sense of belongingness because if people don't have that sense of belongingness, they're not going to stick around. Um, and we'll talk about that a little bit more, too. Next, we're going to dive into some of the pros and cons of a remote first learning ecosystem. Um, we're going to start with another poll. So get your get your uh, mouse ready. So what do you think is the biggest benefit to a remote first learning ecosystem? Um, so we can talk about repeatability. And by repeatability, we mean that we could actually deploy this multiple times. We could have concurrent sessions running. It's not that one and done that we were talking about with instructor led. Flexibility, which means, you know, I can deploy it remotely. I can deploy it on a mobile device. I can deploy it on a computer. Um, I have a lot of flexibility by which somebody can consume this content. Um, distribution, meaning that I can deploy this to a thousand people all at the same time, whereas in instructor-led training, I'm probably limited to about 15 people in a really effective classroom. And last is cost. So the cost efficiency of what it is that we're able to distribute and how much it costs, not only to create the materials, but also to deploy the materials moving forward. So this is probably one of the trickiest questions because it really, it's not always apparent what kind of your best, your best benefit is. Um, you know, a lot of people are saying that it's flexibility. And while, while that is true, um, it's because you, we don't look at cost sometimes as the long-term cost, uh, you know, especially as you look at remote learning, there's usually a high, there's a little sticker shock. Um, you know, there's a high cost up front. You know, whereas in the long term, you're saving all of that money on travel, um, catering, room bookings, um, things like that, uh, you may see a return on your investment depending on the size of the audience that you're deploying to. So as I suspected, flexibility is our biggest benefit at 69%. Uh, we then have cost coming in second, repeatability coming in third, and we have distribution coming in fourth. So thank you so much for participating in the polls.
So now here is another story time, and this is exactly what we were just talking about. So the biggest challenge, I think, with remote learning is the cost. You know, when we produce, um, you know, we're working with a customer to produce a scope for remote learning, uh, the sticker shock is real. Um, and not that it's more costly than they expected, but usually it's seeing all of that cost kind of in one spreadsheet that usually you do have this executive who's sitting there a little bit slack jawed going. Uh, you know, and it really comes down to looking at how that cost is amortized across years. You know, whereas creating a PowerPoint and having a trainer deploy it, you look at the cost of creating that PowerPoint or creating those materials for the in-person class, and it's a very small amount. But that's because you don't consider the cost of people not being productive in their jobs um, because they're having to travel. So they're they're losing time on their jobs to be able to travel to wherever this event is occurring. You don't consider, again, the cost of catering, the cost of booking facilities, the cost of printing materials at times, um, the cost of the instructor, the cost of those people not being per perhaps billable at times. And so as much as people may have that sticker shock from a story, from a, um, a pricing perspective, there's a lot of efficiencies that can be gained as well. So some of the benefits to remote uh, first learning is you can make something that's really realistic. Um, you know, when we talk about in-person instruction, it was really realistic when we were all in person. Uh, you know, now that a lot of us are remote, or at least for part of our weeks we're remote, this is the real world. So you have the ability and the unique opportunity to be able to build those remote connections during onboarding, during the training program, building some of that muscle memory of when I have a question, I go to this team and I ask it. Um, when I have a question, I go to this space and I look at this user database of information to be able to get my answer. Um, you know, I go to this site to be able to access a job aid. Um, you have the ability to kind of build some of that muscle memory of how they help themselves moving forward. Because moving forward, they're not going to have an instructor who passes out the answer to them every time they have a question. You do have the benefit of it also being very repeatable. So again, it's not like when you're in an instructor-led session where you hold it once, and then when you want to hold it again, you're seeing all those costs again. Once you create training, you do have the ability to repeat that for many years to come. Um, we talk a lot as we're designing scopes of making sure that something is in a format where it can be editable, where it can be maintainable. Um, and so there's a lot of forethought uh, that needs to go into a remote first learning about making sure that something is going to be stable for you um, and that you can make sure that you're able to continue to update it and increase the lifespan of it to increase that ROI. Um, by ensuring that it doesn't get out of date. You do have the ability to have a flexible deployment strategy as well. So you are not stuck with, okay, everybody is going to fly to Omaha. That is where our training center is. Let's hope that the, the plane tickets to Omaha don't increase in price. Let's hope that um, you know we can get an affordable costing from a hotel perspective. You can deploy globally. You can deploy in multiple languages. You can deploy to people who are on a sales force who only have a tablet. You can deploy to people who are in an office. Um, you can deploy to people who um, have accessibility needs so that even if they would be in a classroom and they might not be able to hear an instructor, they would be able to participate in a virtual instruction due to um, some of the things that we can do from an accessibility perspective. You also do have that transferable experience because it's more closely representative to what our real lives look like now. Um, you're building, again, some of that muscle memory of how do we engage with one another in a VILT session is how we're going to engage with each other in meetings. Um, how we submit online assignments, maybe how we wind up submitting some of our actual work assignments as well. The biggest benefit that I can think of is that it's a journey, not an event. Um, so whereas instead of instructor-led training being a two to three day event where people are on site and then when it's over, it's over, virtual or remote first learning can be a long journey. It can be 30, 60, 90 days. You can have little touch points that kind of pop in here and there to be able to increase that engagement, to be able to increase the stickiness and kind of keep bringing them back to the learning that you want them to have as opposed to hoping for the best that in that three-day on-site session, you were able to capture everything, communicate everything, and then they're able to do their jobs. 
And lastly, there's more time for comprehension. You know, even as we're sitting in this webinar, it's hard to consume all of this information. I know for me, it's hard to convey all of this information. Um, but just think about what it's like when we're in those in-person sessions and there's a lot of information being conveyed in, a, in, in eight hours. You know, it's one of the things that I frequently do when I do in-person meetings is I never do them more than four hours because I feel like between people's attention span and being able to focus, but also people's want to check email and get the job done and do other things, um, four hours is about the max that somebody can, can handle without wanting to kind of do their day job and other things like that. So remote gives you the opportunity that people can go at their own pace. If the, their cup is full, they can take a pause. Um, they can come back to it when they're kind of ready to receive more information. So here are some of the unspoken negatives. Um, you know, you really need to be tech savvy. Uh, you need to be tech savvy from the standpoint of how to work through challenges. So, and this should actually, I, I apologize, this should say unspoken negatives of remote first training. So you need to be tech savvy from the standpoint of if Zoom doesn't launch, what do you do? Uh, you know, if you're not able to launch a file or you get an error code, what do you do? Um, you know, if your speakers aren't working or you're on mute, how do you unmute yourself? You need to recognize that software isn't perfect. Um, there's usually multiple moving parts um, that sometimes is completely out of your organization's control once it's deployed. You can't control whether somebody upgraded their phone to the latest operating system and now certain things aren't working. You can't control if there was an update to Zoom or Teams or something like that and now breakout sessions take a while to launch. Um, you also have to recognize that not everybody is virtual first. There are still a lot of people who really want that face-to-face -face interaction. They want to have that one-on-one -on -one, um, interaction with their instructor. And so we need to make space for that too. Now it may wind up looking virtual. It may wind up being one-on-one -on -one sessions, um, but we need to kind of consider that not everybody's the most tech savvy person out there. And so we need to either do some upskilling before we start, or we need to build safeguards in and a support system in to make sure that everybody can be successful. The biggest part is the cost. Um, again, there's usually a larger upfront cost and there has to be a lot of trust in the ROI. Um, finding a strategic partner who's gonna help you manage that cost better, help you manage to build deliverables that are gonna stand the test of time help you build things that you can maintain in-house um, and that you don't constantly have to go to a vendor to be able to support. Those are some of the big keys that I'll give you um, as a way to kind of increase that ROI. So a perfect example might be if you're building a software system and you know that it's currently in the process of being upgraded, don't build the biggest, fanciest e-learning training environment to be able to support that. Don't build some sort of virtual virtual environment, you know, maybe use job aids, you know, maybe use, um, you know, your UAT system or something like that um, until things get stable and then build something for sustainability. So there's lots of things that, you know, you can be coached and mentored to be able to maximize your budget, um, to be able to maximize the lifespan of your training as well. So again, some of the pros would be, you know, you can create a virtual connection that translates to real life for those users. Um, building, the abil building the capability to connect um, is going to be something that's critically important to your new hires. And I know that's one of the questions that has come up. When you are a new hire, and I was actually just recently within a little over a year, a new hire here to InfoPro. It was a very different experience than when I first started in my previous organization. So when I first started in my previous organization, I you know, would get up in the morning, I would drive to the office, I was surrounded by people. So there's a little bit of that peer pressure you know, when everybody else is going to lunch that they're like, you know what, we should probably let the new kid come with us. Um, you know, When you had a question, there was somebody who was at the desk next to you um, that you could ask to be able to do that. When you start at a new organization and you're remote, remote only or remote first, it's daunting. You know, you're not quite sure who to ask questions to. Um, you know, there isn't necessarily that camaraderie kind of built in. I was very fortunate that where, where I started, there was that camaraderie and there were a lot of those touch points. And I was so thankful for that. Um, but you have to build some of that into your onboarding program. You have to build that into the experience to make sure that 
there is somebody physically touching base with them. There is somebody who's giving them a list of, hey, if you have questions about your computer, contact this person. If you have questions about th this software, contact this person. And then there also has to be somebody who's actually just checking in, um, because that's one of the things that we know about new employees in a remote only or remote first experience is they may not know to ask the questions or they may not feel comfortable. So sometimes we have to be the ones who check in and say, hey, so how's it going? Is your computer working OK? Were you able to access this particular piece of software? Is everything working fine for you? Is there anything that you need to open that door? Because recognizing that somebody is brand new, they don't know anybody, they're really going to need that support and making sure that those doors are doors and lines of communication are open. You want to make sure that um, the remote first is going to provide that diverse experience for learners. So again, they're not just trapped in a classroom for eight hours for three days in a row, but really giving them a, a lot of different variety of ways to access content things that they can access um, you know, when they need it, things that they can access as a one-time thing, thing that they can interact with, and then still those virtual experiences where they can have um, you know, one-to-one -one interactions with individuals. You know, Some of the other pros are, again, reusable and repeatable content. So it's not a one and done, as we talked about with instructor-led, and we can, we can build that longer shelf life. I will say that that longer shelf life is not always a guarantee, it is definitely something that you're going to have to work towards, and it's definitely something that's possible, but it does take, take some dedication and partnership to get the longest shelf life possible. Some of the cons are it does at times lack the authenticity of what an in-person connection might, might have, and we just talked about that, like people might not feel comfortable asking. Um, it may feel forced at times, particularly with like breakout sessions and things like that. It does have a lot of moving parts that require guidance structure, and I should have also put on here testing to make sure that everything works across multiple systems, across multiple devices to make sure that the learners are going to be successful as they access that content. Um, in the initial phases, it can seem cost prohibitive. Um, there definitely can be a sticker shock to it, as I talked about. Um, and there's also a longer lead time. So this is probably one of the biggest challenges that we face is Somebody might want to do a virtual virtual remote first program. You know, they get past the sticker shock part of it. And then they're like, okay, well, we want it in six months. Now we look at our, our project plans and we're like, okay, but that's going to be a really huge commitment on you to be able to produce something this big in six months and your subject matter experts and review cycles and things like that. The best way to combat that is to have a rolling deployment as well. So just because you're going to launch a remote first learning doesn't mean that you need all of the parts and pieces on day one. So building a timeline that's in accordance with a deployment calendar is really your best, your best method of success. So if you need to deploy something super fast, then your first modalities, you know, maybe you have one that's super impressive, has that kind of wow factor. And then maybe you have some others that can be more rapidly produced so that you can get that training out there. Then you start to focus on, okay, what are they going to get 30 days later? What are they going to get 60 days later? What are they going to get 90 days later? Um, you also talk about the concept of minimum viable product. You know, For that first iteration, if you're budget conscious or time conscious, you might produce something that is what I call a minimum viable product, which means it gets the job done and in time either once something becomes stable or once we have time or once we have budget, we'll make it look sharp and shiny, um, but it's instructionally sound. It gets the job done. That's what we call minimum viable products. So that can sometimes help us with that cost prohibitiveness and can also help us with that longer lead time. So one of the questions that we had related to this is how do we change antiquated management by objectives that only by seeing employees face-to-face -face productivity can be tracked. So that's tricky. Um, you know, I think the objectives are still important. I'll probably get a dispute there because I don't know that everybody agrees with that. But you can still do some pretty amazing things with assessments. Um, and so a perfect example would be with software. So yes, when you're doing software deployment, you know, when we used to deploy like SAP training and things like that, um, you know, I remember building out all of those PowerPoint decks and all of those, you know, learner guides where they would go step by step through something. And you would have them sit in the room and you would have the instructor who walks back and forth across all the different people as they're completing the different actions. And you could see at the end of the day that they got to the success screen to show that they've completed that successfully. 
we can actually do amazing things with technology now. So we can build uh, what I call a show me, try me, test me, which many of you may have heard of. So a show me means that it's just a video where they're watching a process get completed, very much like the instructor at the top of the room doing a demo. Try me is where they're actually able to step through it, um, you know, and they're able to actually practice completing that activity, very much like them sitting with the, the learner guide next to them, walking through a process. Test me is how you can track that productivity is by having them complete the action um, without any guidance whatsoever. You can then time that activities to make sure that from a productivity standpoint, they're able to complete that quickly. Um, there's lots of other metrics that you can do as well. We have done um, some different webinars and success outcomes plans. Um, my, my colleague, Carol Cohen, does some amazing work, if you ever look her up, um, where she actually talks about what is the what are the business outcomes that you're looking for and working backwards from there. So that's really, you know, whether you're doing remote or not remote, that's really how you can make sure that you're getting the outcomes that you're looking for, um, even if you're not in person, that you're still able to achieve those objectives. So in our last section, we're going to talk about how to create a remote first learning ecosystem. So here's the last story for today. Um, this is the story about how I had a, um, a virtual training that I had to produce. Um, it goes back to the story I started with a little bit in the beginning, where I had a virtual semester when I was in school. And there was no there was no really instructor interaction. It was just videos that you would take every week. You would get assignments, you would submit the assignments, and then you would watch a new video, submit the assignment. And it really, you know, because there was no interaction either between my peers or really with my instructor, it, it didn't hit the mark. You know, it was very boring. And it's one of the things that, you know, we don't want to do when we talk about remote learning is we don't want to have our students or our learners sitting in front of a computer for 40 hours a week, clicking on the next module, clicking on the next module, clicking on the next module. We want that to be interspersed with interactions. We want that to be interspersed with engagement and other things that we're doing. Um, I had another program that I had taken when I was getting a certificate, um, which was done completely differently, yet still remote. So first of all, I was able to do it on my phone, which was great because they were all small chunks and I have a full-time job. And so, you know, finding time for a one-hour webinar was just not something that was possible anymore. So I was able to take little tiny video clips and watch them on my phone as I was waiting in line at the checkout, as I was, you know, we were driving on a vacation or something like that. But then there were other activities, whether it be answering a series of questions, whether it be taking a test, whether it be taking a... Um, you know, completing some sort of um, an online assignment, but it, it went back and forth between watch this video, listen to this podcast, um, complete this activity, take this assessment. And so even though I was still in front of the computer all of that time, and even though I never actually interacted with my instructor, um, other than just online, it was a much more engaging experience because there was a lot of diversity to what I was doing. So remote first really looks virtual, virtual first. So you want to make sure that you're making space for connection in the beginning. Um, you want to build that rapport with your individuals. You want to build the rapport between the instructors or the coaches and the participants. You want to build the, the rapport between the participants themselves. You also want to design based on the interaction required. And so you know, we have a variety of different kinds of instruction. We have asynchronous, we have synchronous, we have structured, we have not structured, we have one-on-one. -on -one. Really what you have to do is put your put yourself in those learner shoes. So if you're sitting there in that classroom and you think about that on that in-person instruction that you once had, and again, the instructor is just talking at you for 30 minutes, 45 minutes, talking about a specific process, and you're not really asking questions, you're just kind of in, in a listening mode can totally be asynchronous. If the instructor is teaching and there's a little bit of dialogue back and forth and maybe you're able to ask questions, um, you know, maybe you're able to, you know, partner with, with a team member or something like that, you're definitely going to want that to be synchronous. So don't turn that into an e-learning module. Allow that to still be a virtual instruction. If you have something that is going to be certified, if you have something where there's significant assessments to it, 
you're going to want that to be very, very structured. Um, so you're going to want to still have, you know, a lot of that core structure available to here are the objectives of what you're going to learn. Here's the assessments. Here's the learning path or the learning journey that you're going to go on. Whereas if you have something that's a little bit more of a day in the life or how you're going to do your job, you can allow that to be not structured. You can allow it to be a little bit more free flow and a little bit more real to life. Um, and if you have any times in which in a training, you were really one-on-one -on -one with the instructor, um, a lot of times it might be before class, it might be after class, it might be break, building in kind of an office hours uh, or building in time in which there can be one-on-one -on -one coaching or you can request one-on-one -on -one coaching is a great way to really be remote first to make sure that when you move to a remote um, environment, nothing is left behind. There are no elements of that um, in-person instruction. And so adding to that, I would add, you know, let's be honest, when we've gone to in-person instruction, some of the most engaging parts of it is dinner the night before um is lunch is cocktail hour different things like that so even building in time for your learners to play an online game together in a virtual environment um for them to you know just get together on a little bit of an interactive um zoom meeting or teams meeting or something like that where maybe you pose a question to them and then everybody can kind of have free-flowing dialogue that's an important element of a remote first um learning environment you also need to design with repeatability in mind. So you need to make sure that things can be repeatable, reusable, can also stand the test on, of time because that's gonna really support your return on your investment. Um, you also want to be able to deploy on the fly. So at any point in time, you wanna be able to deploy via an LMS, you wanna be able to deploy via your tablet or what have you, but you wanna be able to have that flexibility so that things can be used on demand as well. And then again, connection is the most important piece. So you want to have a check-in, you want to make sure, and, and frequent check-ins, uh, you want to make sure that people are engaged and aligned. You want to make sure that you're able to recalibrate your learning program and your learner journey in case there's misalignment. Um, so a quick VILT is a great way to do those realignments and then get people back on their track. You also want to try and extend that experience. You know, if you create cohorts in your remote forest learning experience, those cohorts can exist far beyond when that learning experience ends. You know, when I started here um, at InfoPro, I had three individuals whom I worked with. Um, you know, we all got hired kind of the same week. There is a little bit of a bond that exists for having gone through that initial onboarding together and you still kind of remember being those those shiny faces showing up for work for the first time um, that does give you a little bit of, of solace as you move on within the organization and you keep working together on day-to-day -day business. You want to use coaches um, in a very purposeful way of people who will be their coaches in real life. Um, you know, so their managers, their peers, um, other individuals who might be um, center of excellence leads and things like that, allowing them to be coaches who will be coaches in real life as well and building that community where people can interact and can bond together. So two of the questions that we received was, how do you make useful changes to onboarding measures to match the current climate of our remote seeking employees? So we've touched on a lot of that. So we've talked about connectivity. We've talked about building those cohorts because that's all anybody really wants is that same team. You know, if you picture when we were all in a, a, a in-person environment, you want those people who are sitting at the lunch table with you. Um, you know, we're not that much different than elementary school or junior high school that we just want people that we can talk to. We want people that we can, um, you know, have conversations with, um, you know, talk about challenges that we might be experiencing, um, you know, get some of that camaraderie going. You want to make sure that you build that into your onboarding program so that they have that core group of people that they can depend on and then build purposeful activities where they can continue to reconnect with them. Um, you also want to make sure that from a technology perspective, um, that you're setting them up for success from the beginning. So, you know, as we're now remote first, we need to make sure that when the, the new learner gets a laptop, that it works, um, that it has all the software that it needs, that their credentials are set up, that it's there before day one so that they have a, the ability to wake up in the morning, put on their shiny first day of work outfit and be able to start up the computer and get started rather than spending four to five hours on the phone with IT trying to get ready. And last, 
how do you onboard somebody and integrate them with their team and company remotely? Uh, a lot of what we do is to be able to build those interactions together. Um, so to be able to um, build very purposeful, what I'll call VILT interactions, where people are able to engage and build those connection connections, but also building those cohorts so that people are starting at the same time, so that people are working together. I still remember we just had a large group of individuals start um, two weeks ago and having them join a call all together and seeing everybody with their with their first day of work faces was just really exciting. Um, so you wanna make sure that you're building those integration elements into the experience, um, into that learner journey so that it very naturally transitions into their day-to-day -day work environment. So the really, you know, the, the thought that I'll leave you with is our lives are now very virtual um, and why shouldn't our training be as well? So it's something that I really think is, is a valuable tool. Um, you know, we were kind of forced into it, I think at the beginning of the pandemic where all of a sudden we had to sort it out, we had to figure it out. But now I think, you know, with a lot of experience and a lot of knowledge, we can actually use it to our benefit to make it an even greater experience instead of it just being all we have at our disposal. So at this point, I think I'm going to turn it back to, um, to HR.com to close out the session. I'd like to thank Sherry as well as all of you for joining us today. If you'd like to view the webcast again, the archive recording will be available on the HR.com website within 24 hours. The webcast credit will show in your HR.com account within two business days and we'll also send you an email with your credit information. Your feedback is important to us. Please take a moment to fill out the exit survey that opened in a new browser page on your computer. This concludes our webcast. Enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you, everybody. Bye-bye.